I love the idea of instilling these ideas so early, not just the ideas, but the language, because so much of that language shapes how you, how, um, how sage, like how you're going to think about your body, how you're going to now think about like, why am I eating this berry or why am I brushing my teeth or should I take five showers a day? Probably not. Or is it awesome to play with dirt? Yes. Mostly it's awesome to play with dirt, you know? And so I, I think it's like, um, it just creates a kind of like layer to the world. And I think what, what's awesome about talking to kids is that once they hook into and really understand an idea, it like becomes their lens. It, it informs the way that they see everything. And I think that, and you see that of course, with so many other softer or like social emotional skills or con- you've been homeschooling. So I'm sure you're deep in like so many ideas that, and reading about different frameworks and philosophies, but like really like if you can get those ideas and language and words in early it shapes perspectives for a lifetime living a healthy balanced life is no small feat especially when you're a mom with meals to cook laundry to load work to do and humans to raise it can be easy to feel like we're in an on again off again relationship with healthy living but it doesn't have to feel this way I believe living a healthy life has become way too complicated. What we need isn't a new plan or program telling us what to eat or how to live. We need simple, uncomplicated routines and information that's going to help us live our best, most beautiful life without rules and restrictions. Join me, Kristen Dofniak, holistic health coach, certified intuitive eating counselor, and mama of two for weekly conversations on what it means to live a healthy, balanced life, uncomplicate eating, and simplify in every area of mom life. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. Chris here. And I have not one, but two very special guests today. I am joined by my daughter, Sage. Sage, do you want to say hi? Hi. Today, Sage and I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing Era Katz, who is the author of a brand new book for kids about the microbiome. So I will share her bio in just a minute, but I think most of us understand or have at least heard the term microbiome before. But I don't think a lot of us are taught much about the microbiome until, you know, maybe we're adults and maybe we're struggling with gut health conditions or Or maybe we've read an article about the microbiome. But the microbiome has such an incredible impact on our overall health, everything from our gut health to our immune system, as Era shares in this podcast episode. And she is really passionate about really sharing this knowledge with the next generation. So I was so excited when they reached out and offered to send us a copy of the book. And we were so excited to be able to get on and chat with Era all about the microbiome and to have her answer some of Sage's questions after reading the book together. So this interview is an incredible interview, not just for parents, but also for kids. So I would love if you gathered your kids and you guys listened to this interview together so they can learn something about their microbiome and how it can help to improve their health as well. Era is an incredible educator, and she and I and Sage just had a really incredible conversation, and I'm just so excited to share it with all of you. So for those of you who don't already know Era, Era Katz is the author of a kid's book about your microbiome and the co-founder and CEO of Seed Health, a microbial sciences company pioneering applications of microbes for human and planetary health. A serial entrepreneur, it was Era's breastfeeding experience that led her to the microbiome and inspired her personal mission to explore the importance and impact of microbes. Era lives in Venice, California with her husband and five-year-old son, Pax. Now, Sage, did you learn anything interesting in our interview? Um, one of the things that I learned is that in spending time outside and stuff helps your microbiome because there's a lot of new microbes. That's so true. I love it. I love that you've learned something, and I can't wait for my listeners to learn something, too. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Eric Katz. Welcome, Era. We are so excited to have you on the Healthy Balanced Mama podcast today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited, too. I've never had such a young and inquisitive podcast host to ask me questions. <laughs> 
So I haven't yet. Oh, I've introduced Sage in the introduction, but Sage, my eight-year-old daughter is here with me today, here with both of us today to ask some of her own questions because you wrote an incredible book for kids, but I would love if you started just by sharing your background and really what got you excited about the microbiome and just kind of what you're passionate about bringing to the world. Absolutely. So I have loved um, kind of like what you were saying, Sage was really excited about the human body. I have loved biology and nature and the human body and mostly like been really curious about health since I was really little. And my mom was really sick when I was in high school. So um, that was definitely like where I learned how to first read papers and start to research clinical trials. Um, And then that really set off, I think, a lifelong fascination with not just like science, but actually the the, the space between like what we know in science and then how we make choices and decisions for our health. And I somehow became that person that all my friends text about stuff, but that was mostly just because I had access to such like interesting people in science and medicine, was able to kind of synthesize information and really spent a lot of my life as a storyteller, building consumer tech companies, like serial entrepreneur. But I always knew in the back of my mind that I really wanted to go back to health at some point, I wanted to work in something around, um, you know, science. And I think what happened was that, you know, a couple of things, um, and Sage, you're, <laughs> you'll learn this as you grow up, but, um, but, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about as adults is sometimes you find yourself doing a lot of things that you didn't ask yourself why enough you ended up doing those things. And so I actually ended up having, I had a miscarriage at my previous company and I, um, just really became a moment where I started to think a lot about like, what do I want to create in my life? What do I want to do with my life? Um, what's meaningful? How can I create impact? Now I know how to do all of these things. So now I'm like, what am I going to do with that? Um, and then I got pregnant very shortly after that with my son, Pax, um, who's two years younger than you, uh, Sage. And, um, and that really, I think for me, a couple of things happened. One was it made it even more important that I figure out what I was going to do and existentially make sure that that felt really good and that I, what I was putting out in the world. The second was that my fascination with health had only like intensified being pregnant, um, but also my activism for how bad the information out there is when you are looking for information and how much I was surprised by how poor uh, people's advice and other things that you Google and like, just, just, it was interesting to see. And I think I'd already started to kind of have inklings and interest in the microbiome, um, and in bacteria and in our, and how it plays a role in our health at that time. But then I met my co-founder, um, who oversees and is, um, leads the R and D and, and all of the scientific side of what I do. And we really had this like really interesting complementary. Uh, way of, um, of course, him from like the scientific leadership, but me from the like, well, how are you now going to tell this incredible story and impact people's lives? And what does that mean when you translate science to products, to information, to education? And we really felt that um, the microbiome was that aha moment (laughs) that you look for as as you think about what you want to do with your life. And the microbiome to me was like the the thing that was going to change the way we like how I was going to raise my child how I think about the world, how I think about the environment, um, how I think about health, and also an area that I felt was like on the cutting edge of something that I could make a really big impact um, in. And so that's really how we, how we got started. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that your interest started when you were a kiddo. And then it was really that, you know, your entrance into motherhood that really kind of continued and sparked this desire to um, get back into the health world and to share. I know that I've been really fascinated with the microbiome. Um, So I went to school for nutrition years and years and years ago, over a decade ago now, and then into holistic nutrition school. And at the time when I was studying holistic nutrition, I was actually struggling with my own gut issues. And I had never even heard about, I mean, I knew that we had bacteria in our gut. I mean, initially when I studied nutrition school at in nutrition school, it was basically just like, yeah, you you should probably eat yogurt because you need healthy bacteria for your mm-hmm. gut. But really digging more into the research. And like you said, there is so much misinformation out there. There's so much confusion yes. around the around health in general, but especially the microbiome and what is good for it and what isn't. 
Um, so I think that, yeah, what you're doing is, is really powerful. And I love that what you have done most recently is wrote a book that Sage and I had the privilege of reading together, um, specifically for kids. So or for kids and their parents. So it's a kid's book about your microbiome. Um, so I know that you have a son. So what kind of sparks your, these, this idea to actually write a book for kids about the microbiome? So one of the things that we do at Etsy is and care a lot about, and one of the things I spend so much of my time doing is translating science. And one of the reasons that's important is there's an awesome quote um, that goes, science is only finished when it's communicated. And that's a really interesting idea because what it means, and I think we've seen this with climate change, we've seen it with COVID, we've seen it with vaccines, is that really like science is incredibly important but really only can have its impact when it's translated and it can be heard in the right ways and in ways that can make people feel informed, but that they can make choices that they feel really good about. Right. And I think kids, kiddos, like the the most awesome part. And if you think about like what we were brought up to think and how we had the language of all bacteria is bad, germs are bad. You take an antibiotic the minute you have a scratchy throat or a runny nose you and you think about like even just like the food you from a nutrition perspective you think about like the food ideas that we had when we were little and how much that's been debunked and in such a short amount of time science has shown us of how many of those ideas were like not true and actually potentially even harmful uh, as a as a way to think about um the way we make choices every day for our health and so I love the idea of instilling these ideas so early, not just the ideas, but the language, because so much of that language shapes how you, how, um, how sage, like how you're going to think about your body, how you're going to now think about like, why am I eating this berry or why am I brushing my teeth or should I take five showers a day? Probably not. Or is it awesome to play with dirt? Yes. Mostly it's awesome to play with dirt, you know? And so I, I think it's like, Um, it just creates a kind of like layer to the world. And I think what's awesome about talking to kids is that once they hook into and really understand an idea, it like becomes their lens. It it informs the way that they see everything. And I think that, and you see that of course, with so many other softer or like social emotional skills or you've been homeschooling. So I'm sure you're deep in like so many ideas and reading about different frameworks and philosophies, but like Really, like if you can get those ideas and language and words in early, it shapes perspectives for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, and that's really fun. And of course, like kids love to learn that they're a super organism and it's a real word in science. It's not a made up term from like, you know, comic books <laughs> or superheroes. And it's a really fun way to also see how much your body is so similar to the environment. Um, and I think the more this next generation grows up really thinking of themselves as just a living organism that's on this earth, sharing it with other living organisms in this ecosystem that we call earth, it really helps also change some of the ideas that I think have contributed to how easily we thought we were better than. Uh, and of course, that has led to a lot of the anthropogenic or like human induced climate change that we see today. And so um, I think it's for a lot of reasons, but really to make kids feel empowered with this whole new idea about their bodies and um, hopefully feel a little more informed and, and take a little bit of the the um, edge off of when parents say, eat your vegetables. <laughs> they can be like, I'm not eating it for you. I'm eating it for my microbes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that. And like kids, they are our future, right? So giving them this information young, I think sometimes I think what I have found is a lot of parents are sometimes hesitant about giving their kids too much information. And I don't think there's ever too much information. They're going to learn it eventually. So we might as well, you know, raise them to have as much information about the world as possible. And you never know, you know, maybe, maybe one day Sage will be a scientist and work in in that world. We'll see. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I love that. And, And I agree how impactful it can be just that they are more connected to our world by understanding that we, we are all connected, uh, in really, really cool ways and even really teeny, teeny, tiny ways. Right. 
So I think a lot of my listeners, because, you know, they are healthy, balanced mamas and, um, you know, health is at the forefront of a lot of what we talk about. A lot of them will be familiar with the word microbiome, but you explain it so well in the book. And I think as parents, we can all benefit from understanding it at a little bit more of a kid level. So can you just start by, for anyone who's listening, who's like, okay, I've heard that word thrown around a lot. I might've read an article here or there. What is the microbiome before we have Sage jump into her questions? Sure. Well, I'll give you the really, really nerdy definition, and then I'll give you like the less nerdy definition, and then I'll give you the way you could think about it every day. So the really nerdy definition is that it is the collection of all microbes that live in, on, and around our bodies or in any ecosystem. The coral reef can have a, a, a microbiome, but so the microbiome when it's related to human health is the, the collection of microbes, not just microbes, but their genes, their environmental elements, um, some of their structures that all together, some together that live in and on all around our body um, create a microbiome. Now, we also, the, the less nerdy is thinking about community of trillions of, it's just, the sum of all microbes that live in and on our body. If you want to put it in some sort of context, there's about just of those 38 trillion of which are bacteria. And if you want to put it in crazier context, about 50% of your cells in your body are not human, which is kind of crazy. Um, so it, which is really amazing. The, the, when people say microbiome, if they've read an article about it recently, or the way like most moms hear about it or parents hear about it is there the microbiome what people mean is gut the gut microbiome and that's just because it's the most dense microbiome of our body but the mouth for example has about 700 different species and the oral microbiome is its own distinct microbiome and the skin has its own microbiome your belly button has its its own microbiome as you learned in the uh, in the book. Your op- there's an optical microbiome. There's a nasal microbiome. Of course, everyone now knows that from COVID testing. You know, so there's and then for women, there's a vaginal microbiome, and so and of course these these microbiomes that for for mothers who have had children or for for parents who had have birthed children, um, there's a there's a nipple microbiome. Um, that impacts how kids like digest some of the carbohydrates and some of the compounds in breast milk. And so it's really incredible. These different ecosystems of our body are very different, as different as like a desert and a rainforest sometimes. And, but when we say in science, the microbiome, we mean the collection of all of them. But then if you zoom into different parts of the body, different parts of the body have their own distinct microbiomes. So hopefully that's helpful. Oh my gosh. So helpful. And I find it so interesting because even in nutrition school, for me, it was really primarily the gut microbiome. And I think that was where, you know, seven or eight years ago, a lot of the research was, but I think, you know, we've been learning so much over the past decade about the microbiome all around our bodies. And I actually, if you, if you can't tell from the way I'm speaking, I had um, dental surgery last week. And so I'm learning how to re-talk and um, I've been studying a lot on oral health and how to really optimize oral health after I had dental surgery. And so that's been something that I've been digging into. And it, it is so cool to, to learn more about how we can optimize these different areas of our body. Yes, the gut is really important and that's one part yes. of it, but it is, it's all over our bodies. So yes. Sage, we read the book together, right? A kid's book about your microbiome. And so we read the book together. And as we read the book, I actually had Sage stop me. So she was reading it and I was reading it together. And I had her stop me anytime she had a question. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have Sage ask you some of the questions she came up with when she read the book. And so maybe any of the parents or kids who are listening along with us, if they have similar questions as they read the book, um, Um, you can answer some of those for them. So do you want to kick it off, Sage? Yeah. In the book, you say that we have microbes. How do we get them? Oh, that's a great question. This is already my favorite podcast interview ever. (laughs) Um, It's really interesting that you asked that question because our company is called Seed. And actually the, the seeding is actually a process. You probably know seed, like planting seeds. You probably, of course, know that from like planting gardens or farms. But seeding is the process by which you first are exposed to microbes. So it's when the first microbes are kind of quote unquote planted in your body. 
Now, until recently, most people thought that most of that very early planting, those very first seeds happened right at birth. So for, um, for children that are born like a vaginal birth, um, it comes from the mom's vagina. It comes from fecal matter. If you have had a child, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and it comes from like your, your, mo- your mom or your caregiver's skin. Those are the first ones that you're first exposed to right when you come out. And everyone thought that the womb is sterile and there's no way that a fetus or a child before they're born has any exposure to microbes. Now, a lot of scientists are starting to think about and look at, are there things that are happening in the mom's body before a baby's born that might expose a child to some microbes before they're born? And therefore, maybe there's some seeding that's happening or some things happening in the body that are making seeding possible when the baby, right, when the baby comes out. So that's what science is still trying to determine. But for the most part, seeding happens. The first seeds come at birth. Then after you come out, other people touch you. So like your dad or your other parent or other caregivers and grandparents, um, doctor, like depending on if you're born in a hospital or if you're depending or if you're born, born in water, if you're born in nature or you're born at home. So like your environment has microbes in it that also you start to get exposed to. Then if you start breastfeeding or drinking formula, depending on what, what's available, microbes are coming in the case of breastfeeding through breast milk from the nipple that has its own microbiome that actually evolved to be on the nipple over many, many, many generations to know that it should live there so that it can help a child when the child is drinking breast milk help that child digest certain compounds that are in breast milk, which is amazing. And actually a crazy thing that also helps seeding, that's like amazing to think about. A third of the sugars in breast milk are not for the human part of the baby. They are not digestible by the human part of the baby. They are only food for all those seeds that were planted at birth to grow, which is amazing. Then you can be seeded by, if you have a dog or a pet, Dogs bring microbes in from outside. They carry microbes. Um, Your home has its own microbiome. Uh, And then, of course, there's different things that you might be exposed to if you walk outside a lot, if you live in a city versus nature. And so it kind of, there's all kinds of factors um, that impact your developing microbiome. And until you're about four or five years old, you're still growing that like garden. And then when you're four or five years old, you reach something that science calls a steady state microbiome. And that kind of says, okay, this is basically like your micro microbiome. What we know is probably the moment where unless you've had antibiotics or other things happen, it's pretty much like what you're, you're kind of like set for, not set for life because things can impact it, but it's kind of saying it's done with that kind of like first growing phase. Now it's important after that to think about how do you tend that garden? What are all the things you can do to ensure that your microbiome, your, all those microbes, the friends that you learned about in the book can do their job to help keep you healthy. And what are the things you can do to help them so that they can help you? So cool. I'm learning new things (laughs) that I didn't know. And I think that is so, so cool. So Sage, do you have any questions, any follow-up questions, or do you have another question you want to ask? Um, I have another question. What are the best ways microbes make us healthy and how do they make vitamins? Oh, that's a great, that's an awesome question. So microbes do, I mean, as you heard me say before, they live in so many different places on your body and they do so many different jobs, but in your gut, let's just use your gut as a great example, because to your mom's point earlier, the reason so much of the research happens there is because that's like our most diverse microbiome and it's connected to so many things on our body that have to happen to function. So the first thing which kids love to talk about, and you can laugh. It's okay to laugh when I say this. They very important in helping you poop. So, so they play a really big role in digesting your food and also in making sure that poop, after your food's digested, when your poop is being made, it can continue to move through 
your digestive tract and then come out in like a really healthy way. And so actually when you poop, a lot of the poop that comes out are actually microbes. There's a lot of microbes in your poop. Um, and of course, other, other, other things too. So the first thing is digestion. And then part of digestion is not just helping you poop, but also figuring out how it can help take out some of the really important parts of your food and do two things. So certain fibers, for example, from plants are really important food for microbes, the good ones to help them grow. So that's like fertilizer. Some of your food is like fertilizer. So they use it, they eat it. They say no human cells. It's not for you. It's for me. And they eat it so they can, more of them can grow and they can uh, multiply. And that's really important so that you can always have a lot of good, good bacteria in your gut. The other thing that they do, which is really interesting, is that some of the compounds that they get from food, like there's a really cool compound that's in a lot of dark berries called polyphenols. They take that and instead of it being something that helps them grow and just makes them like multiply, they actually take that from the berry and they turn it into something else that's really important for your body. And so they actually kind of like, have you ever seen like Pac-Man or uh, like it kind of like almost like metabolizes it, like turns it, takes it, turns it into something else and then kind of spits it back out to say, this is for the, to help the body. Um, and so that's one other way that they help. And that's also one of the ways that they um, also synthesize vitamins because there are a lot of vitamins that your body can't make by itself that you rely on outside sources for. Often that comes from food. If, if um, I don't know if you guys are vegan or vegetarian or whatever, but like if, a lot of people who are vegan, for example, or vegetarian have a lot of trouble with B12 because it's not really found in a lot of plants. And so microbes make a lot of the things that we can't make ourselves. So things like vitamin K, folate, for example, certain B vitamins, um, and B12 as a great example. And so that's one of the jobs that they do. So cool. Yeah. You think it's really cool? So I have a follow-up question. So what are some of those, those foods, those carbohydrates that are really positive for our gut that help to feed our, our gut bacteria? Sure. So th there's different, there's different ones, of course, like um, one of the things that's really important is not just how many, uh, like, or how the ones that are important, but actually like eating a diverse number of them throughout the week. So like a lot of us, like we are very, very healthy, but a lot of us are very habitual. So you end up like, and I know for kids too, you're like, I just want the same thing that I love every single day. But actually for microbes, it's really important that we like mix it up. In terms of what they actually, just a good like kind of list um, would be things like, so cr everything from like cruciferous vegetables and, um, you know, uh, kales and, and spinach and uh, a lot of dark leafy greens. Um, of course, that's kind of obvious. Everyone would be like, of course you said green, veg <laughs> green vegetables, but even things like a lot of people don't know, like with broccoli, for example, like the stalk is incredibly good for your microbes because you know how a lot of people, when you cut broccoli, you throw the stalk away. Actually, the stalk is like a really important part. It's really dense fiber and it's a great opportunity to like feed your microbes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's everything like nuts, certain nuts and seeds. So things like walnuts, for example, um, really dark berries, like blackberries um, are awesome. Wild blueberries, the ones that aren't too sweet are good examples um, there's things like, and of course, like cauliflower, uh, certainly like sweet potato and, you know, there's, there's, and, you know, different compounds and different, um, uh, foods, the microbes will do different things with, like we were just talking about. Um, and then, you know, really like everything from like lentils and chickpeas. And so beans, of course, are another great source because those are protein, but a lot of them are really dense and also very fibrous, which is awesome. Um, and then, you know, not, not as much for usage, but, uh, there's even like green, green tea. Um, and, you know, and if, oh, one of my favorites is pomegranate actually, uh, mm -hmm. which is another great one. That's awesome for your micro microbiome. Um, so those are some good, so hopefully some good examples. 
Yeah, it's a great reason to encourage our kids to have a variety. And are there any of those that you love that Era mentioned? <laughs> um, I like broccoli. You do? Yeah. Broccoli. You made a awesome. whole bunch of kale the other night too, huh? Mm-hmm. How about blackberries? Ooh, yeah. Pomegranates? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we eat a lot of sweet potatoes. Yeah. Yeah, we eat a lot of those foods already. <laughs> well, well, your microbes are probably very happy. But remember, next time you make your broccoli, don't throw out the whole stalk eat some of the sock too. It's yeah. actually really good. We've got to uh, make some broccoli soup. That's how I like to use the stock is making broccoli yes. soup. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Do you have another question, Sage? Yeah. Why do microbes need salt, water, and oil on your skin to survive? What do they use in the gut? Uh, so, so mm-hmm. in the book, you talked about, um, them needing those, those different mm-hmm. components to survive on the skin. So she was wondering, why do they need them? And um, what do they use in the gut? I think we kind of just talked about that, but. <laughs> yeah, well, we talked about the gut, but the the skin is really interesting. So remember, do you remember CH how I was saying that every microbiome of the body is a little bit different? Yeah. Um, so that means that the way that those microbes learned and evolved to live in those different parts of our body meant that they had to find different nutrient sources and different things that were going to feed them because we don't really put broccoli and sweet potato all over our face, right? <laughs> that would be, well, some people do. <laughs> I'm sure there's a YouTuber or someone who says that's like the secret to young skin. But for the most part, we don't put those foods on our face. But actually those microbes that protect our skin, that perform all different kinds of functions are really important. And so over time, they learned that there were nutrient sources and ways that they could thrive on the skin. And that was through our skin produces those things, right? And so those became the way, and I don't know if you've learned yet in, in your schooling about evolution or adapt adaptation, but when animals evolve or when any plant evolves, they evolve in their environment to be able to figure out how can I survive and how can I not just survive, but make more of me <laughs> so that other, my species can survive. And so in different ecosystems, you can see microbes way, way, way in the depths of the ocean in places where no other and very few animals can ever adapt to live. No light, very little food, no, no sunlight, very, very, very harsh temperatures. And you'll find microbes totally thriving because microbes are amazing at adapting to different environments. That's one of the reasons that microbes have been on earth for so long. They were here way, way, way before us, before humans were. And they're so good at adapting to different environments that if you think about it in your gut, they learned how to adapt based on the food that was coming in from whomever, whoever their host was, which in this case would be you. Um, But then the ones on your skin learned that they had to eat something else because they are not getting what your gut microbes are. And to do their jobs, they had to figure out how to work with your human body. And in this case, they figured out that some of the like oil, water, salt, those are some of the things that help them thrive. And same thing with your mouth, the microbes that live on your eye, different microbes are going to survive kind of through different mechanisms or different ways of um, eating and nurturing themselves. Which is crazy. Cool. <laughs> what all things kids can do to help the micro? Oh, well, this is, is like one of my favorite. Um, this is one of my favorite topics. Do you remember any of the ideas that I put in the book for you? I can remind you, but just in case um, you wanted to share any. No. Okay, I'm going to give you hints. I'll give you. I'll give you. I'll give you a few, and see if it maybe maybe remember some of them. The first one is to be outside and play. Oh, and yeah. yeah, and that's really cool because even in one little spoonful of dirt, there are trillions of microbes, which is crazy. And you can't see them with your eyes. But when you play in dirt and you're outside in the environment, you're exposed to the microbes that are from plants and animals. And it's showing your immune system and it's showing your, your body how to know the things are safe how to make sure that your body can like recognize them and exposing you to all kinds of awesome microbes that are out in the world. There's like really interesting research um, as an example. 
and your mom probably knows this community on the East Coast um, where you guys are. I don't know where, where, I don't know which state you guys are in, but it's on the East Coast. Like in Amish communities, kids never get allergies. And they realize that it's because they're exposed to so many of what they call endotoxins and other microbes and other factors that are helping their microbes learn what's okay, what's not okay. And they're exposed to so many more microbes than a lot of kids that are growing up more like in cities. And so they don't see any allergies in in that community as as an example. Um, So going outside and playing is really important. Vitamin D is another part of that, which is like sunlight. Um, Because I think especially over the last couple of years, a lot of kids have been in front of screens a lot. Um, So it's very important to be outside. The next is to brush your teeth, which I'm sure your parents tell you all the time, but not just because your parents say it so, but as your mom was saying, because from her surgery, your mouth has, we, we call them in my house, uh, sugar bugs, <laughs> but we, we, there, as I said, there's like 700 types of bacteria living in your mouth and they do really important jobs. They are a big part of making sure that you don't get cavities. They're a big part of making sure as you get older, um, you don't develop certain diseases that happen to a lot of people in the in, in their mouths, which kind of are, have become a little bit inevitable with age. Um, they are, they, they are helping digesting your food. Digestion actually starts with your saliva. So it actually, they're a big part of just, even just when you swallow, you're swallowing microbes with your food because they're already trying to do their job in, di- in the digestive tract. Um, and then we're also starting to learn how much the mouth, whether if your mouth is happy and healthy, that it actually is really important for other parts of your body, like your brain, your heart, and your lungs. And that's really cool because we're just starting to really understand like why the mouth is so important in relation to even other parts of our body. And the most important thing is if you remember how I was telling you about microbes looking, needing food, if you leave a lot of sugar in your mouth, you're going to let the bad ones figure out how to take those and produce some of the things that then break down the enamel of your teeth and create cavities. So what you don't want to do is leave, leave the bad guys like any good food for the night. <laughs> uh, and so that's why we it's so important to remove as much as we can um, so that you don't really give them an opportunity to even come out at night and find any good food like sugar to eat because otherwise they're going to eat it and then they're going to create things that then cause cavities. And that's kind of what you want to, you want to prevent it. You want to clean it up before you go to bed, clean it up after you eat and make sure there's no, no food left for them to figure out how to make a cavity. So that's one, that's the second one. The next is sleeping really well. You might think that sleeping is just for your human part, but microbes actually have their own rhythm like their own day and night um, and getting rest and allowing them to rest and letting them do their jobs and letting them like recover is a very important part of them being able to do their jobs well. And then the last is if you do, well, a couple more, but if you do have pets, definitely spend a lot of time with them because they are awesome ways to, again, just like being out in nature get some exposure to other microbes that you really wouldn't get from like your grownups as an example, or from your school. Um, And then one of the last ones, which is really the world that I work in um, is there, you may have heard of things called probiotics, which depending on whether or not you, uh, you believe that you want to take one or supplement with one, there are very specific microbes, not just that we have understood what their role is in the body, but we've also learned how to study them and figure out what could they do to help someone be healthier. And so I'll give you a great example. There's a lot of kids that actually have trouble pooping. As an example, there's so many kids that have trouble pooping now more than ever. And that has a lot to do with the fact of like diet and some of the stuff we were talking about. Not a lot of kiddos are eating enough plants these days. So there are certain microbes. If you remember, I told you in the body, they they can help you poop. And so now we're learning that you can take certain microbes, you can mix them in water, take them with yogurt, with oatmeal, and you could take those and they can move, go through your digestive tract 
and they could help you kind of become more regular and be able to poop more easily. So there are certain microbes that can do very specific things in the body. And that's the world of science that I work in um, also. Uh, and um, I think and I think we talked about it a little bit in the book, but those are some of the things you could do. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I love that. So we loved reading the part of the book where you talked about playing outside and getting dirty. Um, A fun little story about Sage. So Sage was about nine or 10 months old. And um, her papa, my dad, has always had an incredible garden. And we were actually living with my parents for a a period of time when Sage was a baby. And we would let her just kind of crawl around the yard. And he had all of these beautiful potted plants. I think it was like a pepper plant. So with all these vegetable plants um, around the edge of the yard. And I'm sitting um, just on a blanket talking with my mom and she's crawling around. And all of a sudden we look over and she's, she's just at the age where she can't walk yet, but she can pull herself up. So she's pulled herself up onto this, like onto this plant, this big potted plant. She's got a handful of dirt in her mouth. And my mom is like, oh no, it's dirt. And I'm like, you know what? it's, it's probably good for her, right? She's actually getting, you know, she's getting yeah. those minerals she, and she's getting those totally. microbes, right? And so we have this really silly picture of her. We're going to have to try and find it and maybe share on Instagram um, of her with this big pile of dirt in her mouth. And I'm like, you know what? She probably just gave herself a, a really good start. <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. You see, you didn't need my book. You already knew what to do. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it so much. This was so fun having you um, answer all of Sage's questions. You had some good questions as you were reading the book and you're a great, you're a great co-host. <laughs> um, so do you have any last pieces of wisdom to share either with the mom or the kids listening? Hopefully you've got some kids listening now too. Um, you know, I think, I mean, you know, I think one of the things I'd say, like just a, a, a piece of advice is more just to really be now, once you understand the microbiome a little bit and you start to understand and you start to um, incorporate it as kind of like your filter, like every time you open a menu, when you're in the grocery store, when your child's asking you, when you're thinking about like what to make for dinner or um, what snacks to pack, you know, I think it just add, like gives you a, a layer of, from um, that helps or a filter through which you can start to kind of make some awesome choices. Um, I think there's, of course, other things like antibiotics where uh, of course I'm, I'm absolutely not an anti-antibiotic advocate, but there are very severely overprescribed in this country. Um, there's 251 million prescriptions written every year, over half of which are for things that don't require antibiotics. And so I think, especially in early windows of life where you can be very mindful um, and make sure that it's actually like needed and necessary. And it's not just like a reaction. Um, as I said, in the right instances, it will save a life. So I, I'm not advocating not to take antibiotics, just that those can be, I think when you heard me speak about the, as the child is becoming and reaching steady state, those early windows, when there's something really big, like broad spectrum antibiotics that happen, it really can impact health for life. And so you really want to make sure that you're doing those things discriminately and really thoughtfully and mindfully. I think I grew up of the z generation where people just like, if you were going away for the weekend, you just took it just to make sure you didn't get sick, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so I think there's um, just ways of like using those kinds of um, thoughts to maybe just guide better decisions, which I think is awesome. Um, and I think really importantly in all the research that's coming out and for any moms who are either breastfeeding or um, going to be having more children, there's so much now growing research around the role of the maternal gut microbiome and the child's healthy development of their microbiome mm-hmm. and the metabolites that are being produced by your microbiome and how important everything that I told Sage is for you too. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, how important it is for you, regardless of if you're having another child, because we know that um, you know a healthy immune system uh, and and a lot of the consideration of these ideas around the microbiome lead not just to systemic health for your own body, but the health of your family. Because when a child comes home from school with a sniffle, not everybody, it's not a domino effect. If you have a really resilient immune system, and I think more than anything, and one of the things that I'm incredibly passionate about over the past year is that as a parent, you realize you're not just parenting your child, you're parenting your child's com- your community. Because the choices that you make impact everybody, everybody in your community. 
And that is something that we've learned that through COVID, we've learned that through so many, but there are so many lessons of the last year and also so many lessons that the microbiome teaches us in terms of how quickly microbes can transfer around a classroom. One microbe can be spotted on every surface of a, of a classroom within five hours. Wow. So your kids washing their hands and doing what the school is advocating for and making sure that you're caring for your immune system, not just because it's good for you and you don't want your kid to get sick, but it's good for your family and it's good for your community and it's good for your classroom and your teachers and the grandparents that visit those kids on the weekend. And just really, I think, starting to think about parenting, you know, it always says, everyone says it takes a village to raise a child, but actually raising a child means you're responsible for the village. And I think that's a really important take home message uh, of the last year, um, but certainly of the work that I do. And I think microbes are a part of teaching us that. Yeah. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. I love that. I love it. It's such a great place to kind of start to, to wrap up our conversation today. Cause it, it really does. It impacts our whole family. And I, I know we have so many friends and friends of friends where, you know, the one kiddo gets sick and then, or the one kiddo in the school classroom gets sick and then everyone is sick. So everything that we can do to strengthen our immune system and those around us, I think is so important. So I love that. So, um, I have a, a few fun little rapid fire questions we love to do at the very end, but before we jump to those, I would love to hear, um, just where my listeners can connect more with you with seed as a company and get the new book. Absolutely. So um, Seed is very easy. It's just seed.com. Uh, our Instagram is at Seed, which is an awesome account for so much science information and education. Hopefully we do it in a fun way, which we're kind of known for. Um, seed.com slash a kid's book about is where you can go and take a really fun little short learning experience to earn a credit so that when you buy the book, you can get a discount from a kid's company, kid's book about company, which are our partners in the project and a wonderful company is that when you go to their website, uh, I highly recommend you check out every book they've ever made because it's amazing um, what they do. And I would also um, say, and then for me personally, just at Ara Katz, A-R-A-K-A-T-Z on Instagram. Oh, I love it. Um, so they will, I'm sure they will head over and follow you over on Instagram awesome. and get a copy of your book. Um, so I would love to just finish off with some fun little rapid fire questions because we love to just have some fun here on the podcast, though this has been a very fun, <laughs> very fun episode <laughs> either way. So if you're ready, these are literally just usually like, you know, one or one or two, one or two, I guess, word answers or sometimes a sentence. <laughs> I will try my best. Okay. So first question, coffee or tea? Tea. Podcast or book? Both. That's my answer too. <laughs> what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Nothing. I was fasting. What is your first choice if you have to order takeout? The food itself or where I get it from? Oh, it can be either. These days, the salmon bowl from Justa in my neighborhood. Mm, we love salmon in our house, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Early bird or night owl? <laughs> Both. <laughs> I love it. And last but not least, this is the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. So my favorite question to ask, what does balance mean to you in this season? Uh, balance means to me the same thing in every season, which is resilience. And that to me is there will always be stressors. And it's just how quickly one can return to stasis is probably the marker of health and balance to me. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Era. This was such a fun conversation. Thank you for answering all Thank of you. our questions and for all of the work that you are doing with parents and with kids and just with people as a whole, helping them to strengthen their microbiome um, and uh, really serving the world. Oh, thank you so much. And Sage, thanks for such awesome questions. I really appreciate it. It was really fun talking to you today, both of you guys. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Healthy Balance Mama podcast. If you loved it, would you take a screenshot and share it with a friend over on Instagram and tag me in it? It helps me so much to know what you love and are taking away from each episode. If you really loved it, would you hop over to iTunes and give me a star rating and review? 
Every rating and review helps this podcast be seen and heard by more women who need to hear the message of balance and wellness without deprivation. It's the best free gift you could give me. And as a reminder, the information and opinions on this podcast are meant for education and inspiration only and are not to be taken as medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please consult with a trusted practitioner before making any changes. Have a beautiful day, friend, and I'll see you in the next episode.